describe the impact that my father has had on me and on those who had the honor of knowing him. But if I was to make an attempt, I would have to say that he was a person who dedicated himself to helping other people. My father lived his life on his own terms. He was a prosperous, self-made man, and while his success could have easily distracted his priorities, he remained strongly committed to his family, his community, his friends, and to helping others. He embodied what it is to be a good Jew, a decent human being, and he worked to make the world a better place. He knew where the lines were drawn that one doesn't cross, and he stayed well within those boundaries. He had a moral compass, and it helped him keep on track. My father honored and took exceptional care of his own parents, as he did with my mother-in-law, our grandmother, Sarah, with whom he had an exceptional relationship. He sent her to Florida in the winters. He took her to dinner almost every week, and he made sure that she did not lack for anything. He was an active member of the same synagogue since before his bar mitzvah and stayed with them in all their moves and mergers over the course of his life, probably an incredible 80 plus years. He worked together with the late Rabbi Schur to raise the money needed to purchase the Masonic Temple building on Cedar Road, where they moved the Heights Jewish Center Synagogue from their location on Superior and Mayfield. The Heights Jewish Center Synagogue, oh, he served as the synagogue's president for many years, during which the time the congregation thrived. He remained an active member of the synagogue and was dedicated to its success to the very end. My father also served as chairman and as a key member of the cemetery committee for several decades. The work was difficult and taxing and required a special personality to get things done. There were always people who could never be pleased, but he was undeterred and he saw to it that the dignity of the deceased in the cemeteries under his care remained upheld. In this position, it would often come to his attention that there were those in need, and he worked hard to make sure that everybody received a proper Jewish burial. Besides giving his time to community endeavors, he was also philanthropic and donated to a variety of charities throughout his life. Whoever sent him a letter or called or asked for assistance received something from him one way or another. He always found a way to help other people. My father was very respected, well respected for his honesty and fairness by those who knew him. Over the years, many people came to him for advice and assistance and to even resolve disputes. In fact, I remember a circumstance when somebody asked him to hold their money for him, for them, because they knew they could trust him more than they could trust themselves. He helped everyone who came to him in any way that he could for as long as he was physically and mentally capable of doing so. And even then, he was no long, when he was no longer able, he would still try to find a way to help people. He helped so many people over the years. He never sought recognition for anything he did, and he never talked about it. It was just who he was. He set a high bar for me to follow, and I only hope that I can give, I can live up to even a small portion of his example. Abba, in bismani, ani lo hetzlachti l'harot l'cha at ahava v'aracha shemagia l'cha kol kach k'rui. Ani haiti chasir d'rim haiti chasir d'chashvut. Ani mefakesh mimcha achshav slicha. Hear from Alex's granddaughter. On behalf of myself and my family, I want to thank you all for being here. For those who don't know me, I'm Heather, one of Alex's five grandchildren. About a year ago, my grandpa asked me to do his eulogy. I told him I would, only if he sang the song from Fiddler on the Roof Traditions. He gave me that look, the look, many, the look I'm sure many of you know. The raise of the eyebrow, the smirk, the tilt of the head, followed by a nod. Only this time he added a little extra. He raised both his hands in the air and began to sing tradition, tradition. So here I am today. Whether you knew him as a husband, father, grandfather, friend, or James Bond, you probably had the same level of appreciation for him that I did. My grandparents were my life. If it weren't for them, I would not be the person I am today. 
Because of my parents' separation early in my life, Grandpa was much more than a grandfather to me. My grandpa kept me on a straight path and even tried to get me to go to Hawken for school, but I had no interest in that. He loved his grandchildren and took so much pride in all of our accomplishments. I remember when I was a little girl going to work with Grandpa at the bingo hall. I loved the atmosphere, from getting to call the numbers to listening to everyone call me Stacy. I was always in awe of how much he was loved there. One of my favorite memories was going out to dinner with my grandparents every Friday night with their friends. I would sit in the back seat and watch my grandpa brush through his white hair with the comb he kept in his car visor while he would sing Frank Sinatra to my grandma. As I got older, I did not go to dinner as much, but it turned into meeting my grandpa for lunch on Saturdays at his favorite place, Bravo's. I was always greeted with the smiling faces of my grandpa's closest friends. Harvey Goldstein, Al, Dicey, Stockfish, Sanford, and Marty. Most of which I'm sure are up there right now sitting in the infamous back room that I would hear so much about. The conversations were always priceless and I knew how much they meant to him and how hard it was for him to see his lunch crew or the boys dissipate over the years. As we all know, Grandpa was not an overly emotional man. His signs of love came in simple gestures. In the later years, after we lost Grandma, his presence became more precious to us. These simple signs of love turned into, have I told you I loved you today? And big kisses on the cheek. When my grandma passed away, his world fell apart and so did ours. But then a woman as beautiful and kind-hearted as my grandma came into our lives. She was known first as Nurse Betty. <laughs> Betty, or as some like to call her Betty Spaghetti, brought a whole new meaning of happiness into my grandpa's life. They loved watching Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, and Dancing with the Stars, each night taking guesses at what color Vanna White's dress would be. Words cannot express our gratitude for how you cared for Grandpa. Betty, we think of you as a grandma and truly a blessing. You will always be a part of our family. While he lived such a long and storied life, he was the simplest person. He loved his family, his friends, his Jewish heritage, and of course, James Bond. He lived his life with honor, integrity, and a Jewish heart. He passed away at the age of 90, surrounded by loved ones and the sound of Dean Martin in the background. Grandpa, I will always miss you, but I have so many wonderful memories to hang on to. You are much more than a grandfather to me. Your guidance and traditions will carry me through to the end of my days. I love you, Grandpa, until we meet again. first yard site of Rabbi Shur, exactly one year after he passed away, we had a gathering in our shul to mark that first yard site, and wanting to create a sense of how much Rabbi Shur had meant to Cleveland, we invited the Av Bastin, the head of the court, as it were, the chief rabbi of Cleveland, Rabbi Yisrael Grummer, to come to speak. He had known Rabbi Shur going all the way back to Yeshiva Torah Vadas in New York. They had known each other for a very long time. And it was a very meaningful occasion for us in the shul. And, of course, I spoke, and Rabbi Grummer spoke, and then Alex spoke. And Alex had this relationship with Rabbi Shur going back so many decades that the two of them were not just involved as the leadership of the shul with Rabbi Shur being the rabbi and Alex being this longtime president and fundraiser, but that they were all almost thought of as like two sides of the same coin. So imagine me coming in, you know, I'm the, you'll excuse the term, the young pisher coming in and well, how is Alex supposed to look at me after he had this rabbi who was maybe the same age, a little older, a little younger, a little older than him, and here, and having him known for half a century about, and now he's supposed to look at this 
30-something man, boy, coming in. And it became clear very quickly, really within a matter of weeks, but it carried through till the very end. What a mensch Alex was, he would still come in, and I know he had done this during Rabbi Shur's day. He'd knock on the door of the office, and he'd be very deferential so that the secretary would intercom me. Mr. Edelman would like to know if he can come in to see you, as if he needed, you know, to be, you know, formal admittance. But he'd come in, and he'd sit down, and he, we'd just schmooze for sometimes half an hour, an hour. And Alex, giving literally his heart and soul to the shul, was there in the shul in the office maybe four, sometimes five times a week because busy with the bingo game, so I'm saying besides for Shabbos. Dur during the week, he'd come into the office to take care of business, g count the winnings and the profits from the previous night. He'd spend time there. He was there with Mitch, and then he'd come speak with me and, list and talk with Lena. And it was really, you got a real sense that it was his second home. And the questions were not the questions. At first, I was trying to f feel it out, trying to figure it out. What's the nature of these questions? And the reason why I was suspicious at first, and by at first I mean just for the first few days, is because the questions and the comments that he made were so expansive, so spiritual. They, they weren't just the kinds of questions like, how's your day? How about the weather? They were questions about God and Moshiach and the building of the temple and mitzvos and learning Torah. And he'd go on at length. And then I realized, like I said, after a few days, these things actually mattered to him. And as I, I told Neil and Lisa yesterday, one of the things that I admired so much about him and that I really saw him as a friend, even though he was so much older, is that there this this honesty about him. And we had this wonderful honesty of a relationship that I have to say reminded me of home, meaning of the Jewish community in Montreal, where I'm from. Because Montreal has this community, a, a large Jewish community, similar in size to Cleveland, where there's a large population of Jews who are basically what we would call orthodox, except they happen not to be from meaning that they are orthodox. They would never imagine going to anything but an orthodox shul. That's what runs through their veins. That's what the, the, the air that gets pumped into their lungs is all orthodox. They couldn't imagine any other way. But they themselves, because of just life and the circumstances of their lives, didn't do that. But with him, there was an honesty. I was able to share that with him, and he would share that with me. And it was not, there wasn't a shame, there was just this honesty. That's why I chose to read here Psalm 15. Ves yirei Hashem yichabed. That the, the hallmark of this man who's being described in Psalm 15 is someone who recognizes the truth and recognizes what purity is and honors those who fear Hashem and speaks truthfully even when it doesn't look good. And he never hid anything from me. And there was never a sense that, oh, he can't tell me something because maybe it wouldn't look good. Because there was that honesty and that friendship that he opened up to me in that way. He told me that Rabbi Shur told him a number of things. Rabbi Shur had also had this honest relationship with him. They knew each other's number. Rabbi Shur understood Alex, and Alex understood Rabbi Shur. And Rabbi Shur told him, knowing what he could expect what, you know, from someone like Alex, who was truthful, who was honest, but would live a certain life. I heard that he promised Alex that he would live a long life if he put on tefillin every day. And he did. Meaning every weekday, come what may, even when times were difficult, and he asked me how it could be done in different scenarios, if he, people could help him put on tefillin. That's what he did. And he would daven. And even though it would seem to those in, at Heights Jewish Center where the shul demographic changed from what it was when the shul first moved, and it wasn't the same shul as it was back in the 70s and in the 80s and even in the early 90s. And the shul changed, but he may, remained committed to that shul. He remained committed to that kehila, to that community, and developed another group, strong friends, 
He refused to give in to what sometimes happens in other shuls where the old guard doesn't like the new guard and the new guard doesn't like the old guard and people are grumpy. Alex was fine and developed a whole group of young friends in the shul, people who admired him. He sat up in the front and in the front row and when my father would come to visit, he'd sit right next to Alex. And you could see, you see my father sitting next to Alex. And it's like two buddies who just, they haven't seen each other in a couple of years, but they're, they've been childhood friends. And just getting together, my father speaking Yiddish, Alex speaking his Cleveland Yiddish, if you will. And that bond that they had is the same bond that I felt with Alex as well. And I knew people would come, Mishulachim would come to the shul from Israel to raise funds for all sorts of things, for a child's wedding or for some from some yeshiva in Israel. And the shul's tzedakah fund had suffered over the years. Rabbi Shur had made a real effort to raise a lot of money for the tzedakah fund. And there wasn't as much money. Mishulachim would often leave the shul office disappointed compared to what they were seeing in the olden days. But they were lucky if Alex was there. Because Alex would just pull out whatever was in his pocket, and if there were just 20s in his pocket, then that's what he would give them. And he would ask me, should I help them? I said, of course you should help them, if you want. And he went, and, and that's what he did. He told me many times, from my, really my first day there, how one of the things he was very concerned about was the cemetery. He put so much time and so much effort into the various cemeteries that the shul was involved in. And it was, a, it, was, it, was, it was fighting a losing battle because it was like trying to, you know, pour water into a bucket that has a hole in the bottom of it. And as you know, or you might not know, back in the day when many of the people in the cemeteries that are in those cemeteries were first buried, so you can imagine someone buried in 1940s or 1950s and he wants to make sure that the grave will be taken care of in perpetuity forever until Mashiach comes. So they make the big investment of $10 to make sure that their, their grave will be taken care of forever. And that's what they had to deal with. And he was so frightened. He said, please God, let things be taken care of at the cemetery before it's my time. And it was difficult, and different arrangements had to be made, and different negotiations had to be made, and to give over all the knowledge that was in his head to the people now in the shul who are able to, you know, do their part of managing it. And it was a difficult thing to do. The man had file cabinets in his head. Someone would, I, I learned early on not to make the mistake of asking, so what's been going on with the cemetery? Because he would say, look, it's like this. In 1912, and then, you know, it would go on from there because he knew everything and every twist and turn in what had happened. He admired the shul. He admired Torah and mitzvot. He admired the people in the shul. When he would come for either his mother or his father's yard site or, la or later Blanche's yard site, He'd come to Davin with us to say Kaddish. And again, there was this sense, this deep sense of, of respect and, and, and of admiration and of friendship shown to the shul. And if at times all the work that he did for the shul in you know, the more recent years sometimes didn't bear as much fruit or were very difficult, then it wasn't difficult for, to forget that you just had to go back 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years to realize that had it not been for him, there would have been no shul to begin with. And the shul now, all of us, we come in, we daven, and the sanctuary and the base medrash and the aron and all the parts of the shul are named for people that the people right now in our congregation don't even know. We don't even remember those names. Alex remembers, remembered those names, and he was able to connect us to that. You know, I was thinking, I don't have a good metaphor. People saying, you know, he was like, given the age difference, maybe I could have said he was like a grandfather to me, or like a father, a grandfather, an uncle. Like, what relative do you compare that to? It's a difficult thing. For some, it's easier than others. I know that I always thought of Alex and Lena as brother and sister. Like, that was the model. 
Sometimes not just brother and sister, but maybe conjoined twins. You know, always sticking together, always looking out for one another. When Lena fell a few years back, Alex was just on top of the situation, wanting to know every move, every concern. When Alex wasn't well, Lena knowing every step of the way. And they knew each other's imperfections. Lena knew all about Alex. She knew the whole story, the stuff the FBI would want to know. But she keeps quiet. But I can't think of that relationship. The only thing I can think of, and as awkward as it is, and as funny as it sounds, but I, d I didn't think of him as a grandfather. I didn't think of him as an uncle or a father. He, w he was simply a friend, and a very good friend. And a friend who got me, who was concerned about me, who would make sure and ask me frequently, Rabbi, just, just let me know, like, is everything all right? You know, meaning he wasn't involved in the day-to-day -day affairs of the shul anymore as he used to be, but he wanted to m just make sure that I'm taken care of, that my kids are all right, and that my wife, uh, that, every, that the family is okay. Constantly asking, constantly concerned. He had a tremendous love and pride of his family, tremendous appreciation for everything Betty did for him. He was so proud of Neil and Lisa, so proud of his grandchildren. He was so concerned for his daughter Stacy, who couldn't make it here, he was in California, always mentioning her name, davening for her, telling me how much he cared f for her, caring about his grandchildren constantly, worried about his grandchildren constantly. Because since there was a sort of space that even though I've met the kids over the years, but is the kind of thing where his shul life and his family life didn't always uh, intersect too frequently. Yet, we got to know just through hearing him and how much he cared about them. I remember how proud he was when Harvey passed away. That uh, Neil uh, said Kaddish at, at the cemetery at the Levaya. And that's something that just generated a tremendous amount of pride in him. That, that uh, you know, that Neil could do that, that he would do that. I was emptying out the uh, stender yesterday with Neil. So his talus was there and the, you know, the sidurum he was using and we're just making sure there wasn't anything else in there. So he took his talus out and I just had this image of, you know, like the layout, like the architecture of the shul just being off without him there. You know, he'd sit on one side of the bar and there's Mike and Jack on the other side and it's even and, and with my father filling in the fourth seat when he would come and now the whole thing is skewed like a table that's missing a leg. And I feel like the whole shul is missing a leg in that way. I know in the shul will miss him very much. I know given how much his family meant to him and we've seen and we've heard how much he meant to his family how much he looked out for them. That I'm sure the memories that we have, the very vibrant memories, the very honest memories, will provide an aliyah for his neshama, that his soul can just go higher and higher, so he can derive nachas from his family, nachas from the shul he helped mold over the course of these many decades. and be reunited with Blanche as they will be side by side now. And we only want the best for him, the best for his mishpacha in the midst of only good for Klal Yisrael, for the Jewish people that he was always concerned about. Any time there was a bombing, any time there was a stabbing, anything going on in Israel, the next day he couldn't stop talking about it and we'd be together and he was concerned Rabbi what's going to be with the Jewish people and I was like you're asking me I, God didn't talk to me yesterday I don't know but he, he, was, he cared that much and that care should bear fruit and a Kaddish Baruch Hu, God should only give good things to him in the midst of the Jewish people please rise for the Kelmale Hey, Malera 
חכמים שוכן במרומים. המצא מנוחה נכונה תחס כנפי השכינה ומעלוס קדושים טהורים כזוהר הורוקי המזהירים אס נשמס אריה לב בן משה שהולך לעולמו בעבור שאנחנו מספללים בעד הזכורס נשמסו בגן עדן תהא מנוחסו לכן בעל הרחמים יסתירהו בסייסר כנפיו לעולמים ויצרור בצרור החיים אש נשמסו אדוני הוא נחלסו וינוח בשלום על נשכבו ונאמר אמן God full of compassion who dwells on high grant proper rest under the sheltering wings of your presence and the lofty levels of the holy and pure who shine as the brightness of the heavens to the soul of Ari Leib ben Moshe Alex Edelman who has gone to his world and for whose memory we pray may his rest be in paradise may the master of compassion bring him under the cover of his wings and bind his soul in the bond of life may the Lord be his heritage may he repose on his resting place in peace and let us respond Amen the family will be receiving visitors today and tomorrow today immediately after the Kavura and tomorrow from 4 to 8 at the Sherry Park Apartments the South Building and then Sunday and Monday at Neil's home 2474 Bryan Drive please Paul Bearers come forward.